Welcome to another episode of the Wealth Building Strategies Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Constantino, and today I'm honored to have on as a guest, Rich Newart. Um, welcome, Rich, to the show. Thanks, Jeremy. Glad to be here. All right. So, Rich is a United States Air Force veteran uh, and former air traffic controller. Former or still air traffic controller? Still air traffic controller. Wow. Okay. And uh, you have um, invested in um, multifamily real estate and now co-owner, co-GP in over 600 units. Yeah. So again, welcome to the show. And um, I guess let's just jump right on in. You're uh, how, how are you full time or are you full time air traffic controller? Yeah. So 50 hours a week, six days a week, rotating schedules, wife, kids, the whole shebang. And wow. Uh, been doing real estate since 2010. Wow. So how many children do you have? Got three kids. Three kids. Uh, right. Daughter's nine, five-year-old son, and a one-and-a-half-year-old son. Well, that's very close to me. I have, a, I have five children, uh, 10, eight, uh, 10, eight, six, three, and one. Full load. Busy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so let's talk about you, though. You, you're... you're Father and uh, husband and air traffic controller and real estate investor. So, I, how, I get well. Let's back up. So let's back up. So, um, you're a veteran, a U.S. U.S. Air Force veteran. So, I guess talk. Um, well, thank you first. I guess for your service, and um, I guess you want to talk about your uh, service a little bit. Yeah, sure. So I didn't know what I wanted to do out out of high school. Um, started college, realized it was expensive. I was making okay money. I was doing, you know, your normal blue collar stuff, welding on a pipeline and, uh, just wanted more, wanted something new. So my entire family has an air force background, uh, from my dad to all my siblings, my mom, and decided to go that route, you know, get college out of the way, do that kind of stuff, travel the world a little bit, joined, had no idea what air traffic control was, um, Turns out it's a pretty cool job. Uh, I enjoy what I do. It's challenging and tasking, but uh, we've made it work for about 15 years now and decided after my six years, I wanted to get out, pursue a career with the FAA and didn't realize I'd be in so heavy into real estate. <laughs> so you were, uh, you're, you're in the Air Force for, you said six years? Yep. Yeah. And then now uh, air traffic controller for how many years, you said? A uh, total of 15 years. That includes the six years. I've uh, been an air traffic controller at Anchorage Tracon, and then I'm at DFW International Airport now. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I was um, I was grew up in Dallas and uh, just recently moved away. I was in Richardson for, for the last seven years. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a nice part of town. Yeah, so I've, I've flown in and out of DFW many times, so... I guess thank you for uh, guiding me in and out safely. You're welcome. We got a pretty good track record. Uh, how many uh, How many employees work in the air traffic controller there at DFW? So in the Tracon, we've got just under seventy controllers. Seventy. Um, wow. How that's... many? Uh, well, how much traffic is there on a, a given day? Uh, we do four to five thousand operations a day. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty busy. All right. So, yeah. So I guess uh, talk about your um, what got you excited in the real estate. Yeah. 2008. That's what it was. Really? So in 2008, I joined the Air Force. Um, obviously, things started to change a little bit. I got stationed in Las Vegas, Nevada, which was one of the hardest hit economies for 2008. I mean, everybody was underwater. Short sales were crazy. And I wanted to know how all these people were coming in and buying real estate. Mm. So I started reading a ton of books and figuring things out, zero dollars down, all kinds of stuff. Um, we bought our first piece of real estate in 2010, and it turned out to be a great investment. Uh, it just kind of spiraled from there at one point. In I Vegas as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we ended up, oh, a dozen or so properties, and then... We moved around the world a little bit and I didn't start buying again until 2016. And then in about a two or three year span, we bought another 60 rental wow. properties in DFW. Wow. wow. 
Yeah. And that's interesting that, uh, and I love it that the real estate market collapses and it collapses the most, um, the hardest in Las Vegas. And you say, wow, I need to get into real estate. Like that's just, people don't <laughs> think, people, normal people don't think like that, but us real estate, real estate investors, we think a little differently. Yeah. I, you know, I just had the conversation yesterday. Somebody asked me like, what do you tell your investors right now with the market correcting? And I'm like, I tell them like, go, you shouldn't have been buying a year ago. Like that was the bad time. That was the peak. You know, Warren Buffett talks about when everybody's scared, like you need to go in and, and start buying. And so we are, we're finding better deals right now. And we tell people the it's on the downhill slide. There are better deals, more cash flow. Um, sure. It's got its own challenges and stuff, but now is the time to buy. I love it. I yeah. love it. Yeah. That's um, yeah. I started investing in um, 2005. So yeah, I, I saw the down and the ups and the same thing for me. It's uh, I'm, I, I only, I, my only regret in investing in these last couple of years is that I wish I would have bought more. And there's yeah. never a time that I'm like, Oh, I wish I would have not bought real estate. It doesn't yeah. matter in, in ups and downs. Yeah. As long as you stick to your criteria, stick to your underwriting, trust your underwriting, be conservative. You know, you don't have to plan for the whole world to fall apart, but take some, you know, work in some contingencies and uh, buy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, wow. So, okay. So you've bought dozens and dozens and dozens of properties while working full time. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Very carefully. <laughs> I got a great team. My wife works with me. Uh, I've got a business partner. He's stationed out or he lives out in Las Vegas. Um, we started really just as a hobby. I wanted to build wealth for the family and every rental property. I saw it as a way to one day I could cash it out, sell it and send my kids to college. And then you buy, you know, you get to like 10 properties and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm pretty busy. I need to figure out how to scale different financing. You know, you run into mortgage problems. So you get creative and it's basically what we did. So we kind of developed our own routine and just kept buying as many properties as we could and letting the cash flow stack up. And we got to a point where I was go, go, go from before dusk to after dawn. No, I can imagine. Just full time needed. I needed a change. So, you know, the goal is to not be so involved in your business but I didn't trust anybody else to manage our properties really PMs are they can be difficult sometimes so do you still have your portfolio of single family homes in the DFW area we have some we've started selling and owner financing quite a few of them so I've got about 12 to 15 properties I've owner financed for other people uh, so we still get the cash flow on those and then some of them just get flat out sold and so who's the property manager in Dallas uh we are Wow. So, yeah. so you're okay. So let's get this right. You're finding the properties yourself. I'm assuming you're acquiring. Uh, we rely on like wholesalers, stuff like that. Okay. I don't okay. 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 Anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's too much work for me, but still, that's still, you're still uh, um, acquiring them. So do you have different, um, what, what's your strategy on LLCs for your different, for your, your single families? Do you keep them all under one LLC or do you break them out into different ownership pieces? I usually, so we've got a tiered system. The, um, oh, I forget what it's called. We've got a trust and then it's, an, um, you know, like a uh, parent LLC above that. And then each property gets put into its own or we do up to a million dollars worth of real estate in each LLC. Is okay. Yeah. Each different investor is different. Some choose, some investors on one hand have a different LLC for each independent single family residence. Yeah. Other, other people just put it all under one. So you kind of, you're in the, you're the hybrid, I guess you, you max out of, would you say a million dollars? Yeah. We usually try to keep it about a million dollars just, yeah. and it probably would be better to do each individual, but that's a lot of work. We've done quite oh, a few yeah, properties. So yeah. So the the work entail you you gotta have the legal entity, uh, bank accounts, you gotta and then set up, then you gotta buy the property, then 
you need to make probably some repairs before you um, mm -hmm. lease it out, I'm assuming, right? What's your strategy on um, make ready? Yeah, so we buy a lot of stuff that needs work. People that just have intended their properties. We've been a little bit slower buying lately. Uh, basically, we've shifted full time into multifamily. So I'm not necessarily acquiring anymore. It's more just liquidating or owner financing my right. portfolio. But I love coming in doing renovations. I'll do. We've done it up to hundred thousand dollar renovations on some properties. Uh, usually four or five hundred thousand dollars or less is kind of our our sweet spot. Got it. We like the two hundred thousand dollar range, but those are getting harder and harder to find. Oh yeah. Especially in um, but yeah, go in and do some renovations, bring them up to market. We're not doing flips or anything like that. It's just give somebody a great place to live yeah. uh, that otherwise wouldn't be able to live there and try to stay out of the ghetto a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I'm trying to wrap my mind around this because in, from what I've seen and in, in even my personal experience doing what we're talking about, that's good 20 30 hours a week i i don't know how you did that and have full-time job <laughs> like i said carefully we're i am blessed so when i when i go to work you know let's say i'm i'm unreachable for four to five hours that's when i'm actually talking to airplanes the other three three and a half hours i'm able to take phone calls um set up systems processes. We run a lot of like email campaigns. Um, we, you know, dealing with my contractors. I'm always chasing my contractors around or something like that. So even while I'm at work, I still have that time, that flexibility to take care of the things that we need to do. All right. So, yeah. So I guess talk about the, the switch and the focus to now uh, multifamily, I guess, how did that come up? Yeah. So 2018, I was looking for a really good way to network with people that could maybe fund some of my single family stuff. And I went to, uh, it was called the fire summit and it's a local mentorship uh, group called think multifamily. Fantastic group. I've been a part of them for two years now. Um, met Mark, the owner met a lot of his people that he does business with and really got sold on multifamily, why it was great, why, you know, I fell in love with the numbers, how analytical everything is, evaluate the deal, finding the deals. I, I really love finding deals. It's so much fun to, to find the value that you can add that other people aren't doing. Right. And 2018, I wasn't 100% sold on it. I started really educating in 2018. We didn't buy our first property until 2020. Wow. Okay. That's interesting. You know, um, a lot of people that are just starting out in real estate, they always ask, okay, Jeremy, what, what do we, what do I do first? And I always say, just start reading the books, start listening to the podcasts, yeah. uh, start educating yourself. And so, yeah, you're saying, wow, almost two years of just soaking in information. Yeah, I wasn't, it was, everything's a mental game, right? It, it's what we think about ourselves and what we think about what we're doing. And so, I had to really convince myself that this was a, a logical step. I didn't think I could raise four or $5 million, you know, that I didn't believe enough that doing a 20 or $50 million deal was realistic. You know, it sounded so far fetched and right. um, yeah. So you read and networking is a big part. I love networking, maybe not in a group setting, but one-on-one -on -one meeting people hearing everybody's stories, which right. is a huge part of the entrepreneurial business. Fantastic. Yeah. I Going back to what you said earlier about uh, finding deals um, and how you like that. Uh, can you share about your process for looking for properties? Yeah. Your uh, so I love touring properties. So we find a deal. Uh, usually, I guess we can go even before that, finding a market that you want to be in, whether it's an already hot market or a market that's coming up. You spend a lot of time doing that analysis before you ever start calling brokers and, you know, touring properties. But once you get honed in on a market where you want to be, we've got some secondary and tertiary markets that we really like. For instance, Warner Robins, Georgia, you know, probably closer to a tertiary market than anything, but we've had a lot of success out there. 
And then there are other markets that sell themselves, Atlanta, uh, DFW, Houston, Corpus. Oh, so, you, so you're looking outside of uh, the Dallas area. Yeah, we do. Texas and Georgia are major markets and um, we've got primary, secondary and tertiary markets in, in each state that we look at. So what tools do you use to search and uh, what platforms? Um, as far as you, are you in CoStar every day? Are you, um, what, um, are you working with brokers, wholesalers? Uh, not so much wholesalers. I really don't feel like wholesalers in the multifamily space understand what's going on. Honestly, uh, we just haven't had any luck, you know, maybe I don't have those connections yet, but we do have a lot of great success with brokers. We do a lot of touring, a lot of traveling, talking, you know, golf, hang out, learn people's stories. You know, everybody's got a reason they're in this business. And if you find that out, then that's a really easy way to connect with people. For instance, I just toured a property right before this and it's an on-market property that we like. We'll be going after here in DFW. And while we were touring, we start talking about other properties that they've got coming up that are off market. Nice. So that's a lot of our, that's a lot of our deal flow. You know, maybe I'll take a thousand dollar trip to Atlanta, Georgia with a broker that I've known for a while looking at one property, but that'll turn into seven or eight property tours in a day. Sometimes it's right. crazy. And right. Right. half of them are off market. Right. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So I guess what's the process after you find something that you like, what, um, you want to share some of your underwriting techniques? Um. Yeah, so we've got a really great analyzer. It's actually Think Multifamilies Analyzer. We modified a little bit as we need. Uh, we've tried building our own before. It just doesn't quite work as well. Um, once we know we like the property, we've already done kind of some preliminary underwriting. You know, we'll throw in market cap rates. We do check CoStar. We get those from our broker. We don't subscribe to CoStar directly. Um, figure out what rent premiums or maybe what, the current property owners not charging for or are the in-state out of state do they own other properties around here what's their portfolio look like and then we tour the property and from there we'll kind of dive into a deeper look dealing with property managers and budgets uh, insurance quotes debt quotes equity trying to line that up at that point usually by the time we've toured a property we know we want to submit an offer on it right I'm still contemplating this. You're doing all this while working full time as an air traffic controller. Sorry, I just I I need to process that. <laughs> I've got a lot of great people around me. My wife is phenomenal. She runs her own businesses. Um, we we're a really good team, and that's what it takes. Honestly, when you're doing these types of transactions, traveling, she travels, I travel. We've got the kids. We still spend time with them. You know, they still know who their parents are. Um, but it's all for a bigger cause. You know, we That's know right. you, you have three children. Sorry, I, I have five children. So I, I know I know what you go through every day. <laughs> That's why yeah. I still can't wrap my mind around this. <laughs> yeah. We're careful. I don't get to do everything we want to do. You know, if, if that were the case, I'd be at a conference every weekend. Because um, you love uh, the networking. That's right. <laughs> not that I'd really want to be at a conference every weekend, you know, but. Um, yeah, we're, we're selective on what we do. We're quick to say no, but when it comes to a yes, we know exactly what we want and that, that makes it easier. So what advice do you have for, um, full-time workers that want to, um, to, you know, to mimic what you're doing and to do full-time multifamily and be, be an active, uh, general partner, I guess, what, what would be some of your tips that you could give somebody that's looking to be really active? While, um, while being full-time. Yeah, I'd say it was really hard for us in the beginning to niche down, to be really specific about what That's we good. wanted. Good. And yeah. so a little story on, on what we did, my partner and I were just so excited to be in the, in the space and we're meeting all these people and we're like, okay, we're going to be in Texas and Georgia and Tennessee and South and North Carolina and Florida. They're all great markets. And then we had... And it was like on a weekly basis, a hundred properties coming through and we're trying to underwrite all of them. And we're trying to build connections, connections and teams in each mm -hmm. state. Yeah. Um, 
we were just so inundated. We had no other time. We were underwriting. We were even hiring, you know, like VAs to help us do data input and stuff. And it just didn't work. And then we, we obviously got tired of that pretty quick and we're like, all right, we need to draw this back. Let's pick two states and then we'll pick one or two markets in those areas until we can buy enough and we can get good. Right. And then it kind of simplifies things. So by we wanted deal flow in the beginning, but it's just so easy to get swamped. You got to know when to say no to something and people respect that. I think, you know, so our broker relationships, they send me a 1960s product now. Well, they don't anymore because <laughs> we don't want to do 60s products, but before, okay, it's a mid sixties. We'll take a look at it. And then, you know, he haul around, maybe submit an offer. And now we're just like, no, I, give me an eighties product. That's what I'll, I'll, I'll do some eighties stuff. Give me a C or B project, you know, C or B area, nothing in the ghetto. If it's outside of those requirements, we just don't want it. It's yeah. Yep. Niche, the niches bring you riches. That's the saying then. That's a, that's a very good point. Very good advice. People getting in in real estate um, for the first time need to need to perfect their their niche uh, from the get go. Get good at, it, and then you can and you can expand out or expand vertically or try some different things. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. We wanted to be great at everything. I think everybody does to an extent, but you you figure out some of the things you're good at and maybe you do everything for a little while while you're getting started you know whether it's raising capital or finding the deals or you know you'll fall into place eventually if you do it long enough um, don't be afraid to fail uh, would probably be my number one thing too many people will get kicked in the teeth and then they quit yeah. and then you never you never realize right. if it, if you could be good at it so talk about the the same you know same same question of what would be your advice to a full time uh, worker? Uh, what would be your advice of saying you know maybe being an active GP is not right for you, and maybe it's better just to you to be a limited partner and, and invest passively, and you can be hands off, and you don't have to spend that time. So I guess talk to the potential investors out there that uh, that may invest in some of your projects and say hey you know maybe being an active investor is not right for you. Maybe it's better to be a passive investor. Yeah. Uh, so we've got a couple of, I call them full-time passive investors. They, they run it just like a business. Those guys are awesome. They know the hard questions they've been in and out of it, but they know that's, that's what they do. You know, all of their money goes towards their passive investments. And um, I would say it is difficult being full-time W-2 and an active investor, there's a lot more risks that we take that people don't always see. Um, so you've got to familiarize yourself and get educated on what it actually looks like. It's not all right. roses and rainbows and you don't close on a property and you're cash flowing a million dollars a year. It just, it's a delayed gratification thing. And you have to understand that. So um, there are ways that you could be an, you know, take a GP role and be maybe not so active if you have a bunch of capital, you know, risk capital is a, a great thing to put up and can score you some GP points and give you a good shot at maybe you're not directly responsible for the asset management or, uh, you know, taking the lead position, but you can get a good look at it. Uh, you take a little bit of risk and be influential and, and be influential in some of the key decisions. Yeah. In the business you know, plan. It, it at least gets you a spot at the table. Um, asset management's a good one. Although I probably wouldn't recommend somebody working a full-time W2 and being an asset manager. That's those guys are busy, man. We, we hire that stuff out. It's, I've done it before. I enjoy it, but it is very time consuming and it's kind of babysitting uh, when you're, when you're dealing with a value add asset. So 
Excellent. So what's the, uh, what's on the horizon for rich and your, and your business, I guess, what are some of your goals and where are you guys looking to, to do next? Um, so we are working on our capital raise game. Uh, we would like to be able to do four to 5 million a couple times a year. Um, not just for ours. We like helping other people as well. We work with a lot of great operators out there and, uh, it is hard to find capital when you're newer, you know, maybe you've only done three or four projects and you haven't sold one, uh, you've gone full cycle. Um, <clears throat> we like to take the time to get to learn the operators and who the sponsorship team is and help those guys close deals and build their reputation in the business. Um, so we're focusing pretty heavily on that. Um, we would like to be able to scale as well. Obviously 600 units, it sounds like a lot, but it's a relatively small portfolio when you take a look at people that have been doing this for 10, 15, 20 years. Um, we are looking at doing some expansion within Aviana Group vertically. So property management, project management, social media, hiring those types of things out. I think it's really important to Maybe not all aspects, but uh, it goes a long way when you're financing some of these properties with the lenders and your investors when you have a professional team as a part of your group. Yeah, be, ver be completely vertically integrated. Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. Okay. Well, thank you for coming on this podcast. Um, any final any final thoughts for um, investors that are working their way up? Um, trying to trying to conquer the real estate world yeah i'd say um there's a lot of people looking to be active in the space like i said really take the time to learn if being active early in your career is worth it and something that's feasible um there are a lot of very successful people on the passive side i've met a lot of great passive investors and honestly they probably know way more than i do about investing because they've spent the time and the knowledge and they have more time, which ultimately I think a lot of us, that's what we're looking for. Right. So don't just shy away from the passive investment because you hear a lot of people talking on podcasts about how successful they are on the GP side. It may not always be true. That's right. That's really good advice. Really good advice. Well, thank you so much, Rich, for coming on the show and that's a wrap for this episode of the Wealth Building Strategies Podcast. Thanks, Jeremy. It's glad to be here. Thank you so much for coming.